Okay, thank you. We will make a start. Uh, first of all, can I welcome everybody who's uh, joined the call uh, today? I hope you enjoy the uh, conversation and presentation we're going to have. And my guest today for the third in this series of energy conversations is Lawrence Leesk. Now, Lawrence uh, originally started life as a lift engineer, uh, but then uh, a, a life-changing uh, incident uh, shifted him into the energy domain, and he's moved over to be uh, a refrigeration uh, expert and has got a wealth of practical experience. And the reason why uh, I wanted Lawrence to make this presentation was that I've heard him talk before about some of the practical things that his company Excalibur has done in, uh, in the world of chiller energy saving. Uh, it's not a sales pitch. Uh, you'll find it's perfectly uh, neutral and informative. Lawrence, welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vilness, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of pictures today, and um, hopefully a lot of useful information. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, chillers and EC fans. Uh, and as Vilness yeah, said, I'm not going to try and sell EC fans to everybody. Uh, it's more about the application. I expect everybody knows, but EC fans, electronically commutated, brushless that's, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So everybody, you'll hear me interrupt Lawrence from time to time, to time uh, through the course of his presentation. He's very patient about it. Sorry, Lawrence, carry on. No problem at all. So the, uh, the project that uh, we're going to talk about is an actual project rather than something that uh, people are looking at or, 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 or is uh, are dreaming about. And it's three process chiller, uh, chillers. Um, and the application is uh, process cooling. I'm going to make a couple of statements um, right at the beginning here. Um, first of all, condenser fans only account for 5 to 10% of the total energy consumption for a chiller. I do think that the uh, EC fan companies do tend to think that their fans are better than each other's, but in reality, the fans only account for a small percent of the total consumption. And the second point I'm going to make is head or discharge pressure is probably the biggest area of energy saving in refrigeration. And I'll go through this as we go through the presentation. So I'm just going to do a very, um, let's go to, let's just try the uh, laser point. So if, if we look at refrigeration system and, and split it into two, can you see that okay, everybody? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. We, we've got a high and a low side. So we've got the compressor compressing the gas which comes into condenser it's very hot we have to lose that heat for the refrigerant to condense into a liquid the liquid refrigerant then travels to the expansion valve which is a metering device and then we let off change the pressure there and the refrigerant changes state it absorbs all the heat and comes back as a low pressure gas back to the compressor my, uh, my original statement was about head pressure which is the condensing temperature. And I'll go through that through the presentation. So don't, don't worry too much about that. So the, the process that we involved is site survey. We do an energy analysis that's back at the office a report. We specify and design the equipment and we do an investment grade proposal. The second part really is technical support for, for a CapEx. We undertake the installation, commissioning, handover. And in some cases we're involved in uh, verification and measurement of the project. I think at this stage it is worth saying that if you can't provide good technical support for your project it, it, it won't go through. I think particularly with chillers people don't want um, people uh, trying to change the controls or change the fans if they're not competent that um, they're going to do a good job. So I'm going to go through a quick survey with you. So here we've picked up um, the data plate, there's a couple of bits here that are interesting. So we've got the refrigerant, got the year of manufacture. It's a two circuit machine, um, five fans per circuit. But the important thing here is to pick up this uh, model number because the models vary considerably and that will have an effect in some cases on the performance of the chiller. 
This air cooled chiller has got two circuits. Um, the circuits go the whole length of the chiller and you have cool air being pulled through the coils and the warm air being rejected up through the condenser fan outlet. So this is a, a two circuit York machine. In this case, when I did the survey, the first thing I noticed was this baffling at the top of the fan, which I have seen uh, quite often. And it's normally there for two reasons. It's normally there because there's problems with noise or there's problems with short um, circuiting of air. Uh, and I'll talk about that briefly um, to, to you. This is the um, condenser fan, which um, you can see is very difficult to see. Uh, and actual fact, this type of fan is a motor that is attached to a, a frame and then fixed on the side of the chiller. So it's very difficult to work on. But this is the existing condenser fans. And typically when we look at a chiller, we see the cool air coming in, the heat transfer taking place, and then the air being rejected up through the condenser outlet. Now, if we have short circuiting, what we see is very simply is the warm air coming back through into the condenser. And you'll probably hear this, me say this several times throughout the presentation. The rule of thumb in refrigeration is for each one degree centigrade increase in condensing temperature, refrigeration efficiency is reduced by two to four percent so as you can see here we've got five degrees extra um, above the ambient temperature sorry 15 degrees that could have a dramatic effect on the performance of the chiller this is a couple of examples where we've we've seen short circuiting this is a building here that's got in a in a, an atrium and there you go you can see that there the hot air is hanging around the, yeah. the building and they had uh, very, very um, big problems with um, duty. Um, the dry coolers in the far and chillers in the left. So you're saying they actually had capacity problems? They did on the dry coolers particularly because the dry coolers were sized for a uh, 32 degree ambient and we were seeing as almost eight degrees increase on air on temperature. And that was in London. So, so it was, it, they, weren't have, they were having all sorts of problems. This is a roof of a chiller that I surveyed. Doesn't look particularly um, bad, but actually when you look at it from above, from uh, Google Earth, <laughs> you can see that, that the warm air is, is, is definitely having problems being rejected, particularly if the wind is, uh, you know, no wind. This is another uh, job here that we did. Um, again, they're having troubles here with noise and, and uh, rejecting heat. As you can see from the building, if, the, if there was no wind, it, it basically, um, the, air, the air got re, you know, reheated. If you're doing a survey, always wor worthwhile looking underneath the chiller. These um, York chillers, the very good chillers, they're a, a W or an M configuration coil and 50% and of the air of the heat transfer is underneath the chiller. And if you look at the top there, you can see um, signs of um, signs of dirt at the top of the chiller there. This is a, a, a job I looked up in London and uh, looked underneath the coils and I've basically scraped that with a, um, a clipboard um, and you won't be surprised to know that if you've got dirty coils it will dramatically affect the efficiency of your chiller. Lawrence, could I interrupt you for a second? I forgot to say to people listening in, uh, if anything that you see prompts a question, can you type it into the chat channel through the text chat? Daniel's monitoring the text chat and he'll pick up any questions which and relay them to Lawrence. Sorry, Lawrence, carry on. No problem. Um, so, yeah, so when you're doing the survey, what we're looking for is operating pressures. Um, sometimes you'll see um, gauges, so you've got low and high pressure. Um, in this case, we were able to get the pressures from the York controller. So we've got system two, which is circuit two. We've got such in pressure of uh, 2.05 bar and discharge pressure of 11.7 bar. 
and that's really really important information if you can't get this information from the chiller it should be available in um, service sheets or commissioning sheets so refrigerant and pressure are linked discharge pressure is condensing temperature and such and pressure is evaporating temperature to convert pressure to temperature uh, you can do uh, old-fashioned pressure tables or you can download one of the apps this one is the um, Danfoss app which I, I quite like it's quite easy to use so you select the refrigerant which in this case is 134a we put in our discharge pressure of 11.74 and it's given us our condensing temperature which is 48.69 degrees now that's higher than you would expect because the survey was done uh, during a cool day. I think it was about 15 degrees. It was up in the north. Um, so that's quite high. Wow. On this the other is, hand, when uh, we look sorry, at... This, no? is th th this is available on the web as well. They have a browser version of this, don't they? They do, yeah. For anybody who just wants to use it casually, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very good tool. Um, I could do a separate presentation on refrigerants, but I, I won't do that. But... <laughs> Uh, 134A is a low pressure refrigerant. If we go to the um, suction pressure to get the evaporating temperature, we've got 2.05 bar, 1.225 degrees. And that's what we'd expect to see on a chiller because these chillers are trying to maintain a flow return temperature. I think it's somewhere between five and seven or five and eight degrees. So you'd be evaporating about one to give you your five or six degrees leaving temperature. And, and this is um, quite important to understand. So the relationship between pressure, you can see it's very difficult to control fans when you've got um, a very small um, pressure dif differential. Um, so 39.5 degrees, 9 bar, and 12 bar, 49.36 degrees. So you can see for only a couple of bar, that makes a huge uh, difference in the condensing temperature. And then here we go. For each one degree reduction in condensing temperature, the system lift efficiency is proved by 2 to 4%. I'm going to explain what the system lift is in a moment. The lift is a difference between the discharge and the suction pressure. And it is essentially how much work the compressors have to do. The greater the system lift, the less efficient the system is. And in reality, you want to re reject as much heat through the condenser as possible so the compressors don't have to do as much work. Seems to have lost a, a slide. So this is a, um, a, a graphical interface from a refrigeration monitoring system. So the top line, the red line, is discharge pressure. Along the uh, vertical there, we have pressure in bar. And along the horizontal, we have time. And at the bottom there is we have in the suction pressure. And the suction pressure is much more stable, which is what we'd expect. But the discharge pressure, you can see this sawtooth effect. And in, in reality, this is the fans changing, um, either coming on or off, or changing speed, trying to maintain uh, discharge pressure. That's quite a coarse control from the look of it, the way the fans are scheduled to come in. It, it is, but as I said, with, with 134A, it's, it's a very low pressure refrigerant. So if you're trying to con, 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 control fans, it, it's very difficult to find the right setting. Right. Um, and people tend to be, um, when they commission these systems, they tend to be um, very cautious in how they, they control them. So to... Work out the system lift, it's 12 bar, which we're taking as the average, minus 1.5 bar for the suction to give you 10.5 10, 10 bar. So that's your system lift and how much work your compressors are having to do. So the survey overview, we've got three York chillers, um, 2007, so they're not all that old. On 134A, each circuit has five um, condenser fans, um, and each circuit had a single screw, screw compressor. When we take the chiller information, the nameplate, we can 
download or we can go to our library of um, manuals and we can look up the chiller and we can gain the performance details and, and uh, details on the chiller. This is an extract from the, the chiller manufacturer's brochure and it, it's quite interesting. So each, each of the chillers is controlled by a VSD, which is, is very good because that gives you excellent part load performance. So I thought, you know, there's not going to be much we can do with this chiller. It looks, it looks fairly efficient. Uh, the next extract I read was about the fans. So the condenser fans are two speed. Um, they operate in high speed when the ambient is high and low speed when the ambient is low. I don't know where they take the low and the high ambient because the machine was designed and made in Mexico, but it's installed uh, in the north of England. Um, the, when you look into the brochure, I found that the condenser fans, the two speed is actually switching between star and delta, which gives about a 20% difference in speed. So there you can see the maximum speed of the fan, 448 in low, and full speed is 628 RPM. That's quite, that's quite an interesting point because I, um, that's quite a lot of slip, isn't it, in the star configuration? I wouldn't have expected yeah. it to slow down so much. So how, how does that work? Uh, I don't know. That's something I think I'd struggle to answer. It's, to, it's just to do with the speed because the, the, if you look at fans and pumps on the cube law relationship, if you reduce the, a fan by 20%, you will halve the power consumption. So you're, so in effect, um, that's almost what you've done here. Yeah. It's that 20% speed reduction that's that's really saved the energy. So you wouldn't see that on a on a on a something a linear device or a normal motor. No. So all the fans operated on each circuit together, and the fan speeds would control on discharge pressure switching between the two speed, slow and medium. And I'll just make this point again, it, it comes back to the short cycling. If you have slow or medium speed fans, the velocity through the coil is very low and that does create the environment that you can get recirc of air. Fans control of discharge pressure and we saw a 4.5 bar differential between the fans coming on and going to full speed. So the type of fans controls very speed because it's reactive. Slow speed fans can cause short circuiting, cycling. Because of the lack of speed limitations, maintaining the most efficient discharge pressure is difficult. The next part of our process is the energy analysis. And this is based on the actual uh, design conditions and the operating conditions of the chiller. So, um, basic details goes into the front page. So we have the capacity um, and absorb power at two different conditions. So condensing at 45 degrees and 30 degrees. And as you see, the COP goes from 3.69 down to 5.62. Um, we put in details about the fans the uh, details about the chiller and its operating conditions, which then gives us, um, here we go in detail. So we've got a COP of 3.69. So for each one kilowatt of input power, you get 3.69 kilowatts of cooling. If you're able to drop the condensing temperature down to 30 degrees, the COP goes up to 5.62. There's a short section on the condenser fans and the design data. And then this information at the front of the sheet then um, does some calculations, which is, is based on the UK dry or wet bulb ambient, depending on the type of machine. It breaks it down into bin data. Uh, we've got the load, the condensing temperature. It calculates the amount of um, fan power you use and compressor power, and then gives us a total for the year based on those conditions. So that's the, the chiller as is. And the third page, then we're reducing the, the condensing temperature by 10 degrees to 38 degrees. 
So there you've got the new condensing temperature. We've got the new um, COP, the improved COP. In some cases, we're going to use more fan power because we want to reject more heat through the condenser. And that's calculated along here. And then that comes along to columns at the bottom and calculates the uh, chili consumption. So at this point, you've kind of set 38 degrees as your expectation of what you can achieve. Yes, yeah. yes. The, um, I could come back to this 38 degrees, but there are limitations on all types of compressors and depending on the refrigerant. So 134A, which as I said earlier, is a low pressure refrigerant with a screw compressor, you do need to maintain a decent differential for the oil which tips the uh, the lubes um, so we have to uh, work with the manufacturers to find out the uh, minimum condensing temperature okay. that we can operate the the uh, compressors at so this is a result of our analysis which says if we drop the condensing temperature by 10 degrees we get a 21.58 percent improvement in power consumption going from 987,000 to 774,000 so how do we do that? Well, we're going to remove the condenser fans. We were going to carry out a full deep clean of the condenser coils, install new EC fans with new digital fan speed controllers. And in this project, we fitted a, a low pressure air intake screen. So why EC fans? I said, this is not going to be a, a sales pitch for EC fans, but EC fans, unlike AC fans have built in speed control. And that makes them absolutely ideal for all fan applications. So there's no need for additional speed control devices like inverters or phase cutters. And EC fans can operate safely as low as speeds at 100 RPM. Just, uh, if I could just interrupt there, 100 RPM, um, you're not going to get much uh, air velocity off the, the fan like that. Are you then running into the risk of short circuiting because of the, the low air velocity? Um, well, the, 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 the fan's got a slightly better design that allows the air to move um, vertically. But the, the, the difference between what we're proposing is, is that if we see an increase in, in uh, condensing temperatures, the fan will speed up. Okay, <laughs> yeah. But of course, if you're, in, if you're in Manchester on a, you know, on a cold day and you've got a 25 miles an hour wind, you won't get any re recirculation. Sure. Um, but it's a good question. Um, so a 0 to 10 volt signal controls the fan speeds and fan speeds are modulated to maintain the most efficient condensing temperature. And EC fans are more efficient than AC fans, particularly across all speeds at the lower speeds. So I'm just going to go through the project now. Um, obviously we had to um, have scaffolding erected and we had to remove the additional baffling, which we couldn't find out why it was installed, but we, we suspected it was to do with the low speed fans. So it's literally, um, literally baffling. Yes, it was baffling. Um, so um, I'll just talk a little bit about coil cleaning. Um, it's one of my favorite subjects, but um, condensers should be cleaned in the opposite direction of airflow. So as you went back to that first slide where air comes through the outside of the coil, um, if people are cleaning coils from the inside, um, from the outside, all they're going to be doing is pushing deep, uh, you know, debris deeper into the coils. Um, it has a huge effect on performance. And this may seem, you know, a very pointless slide, but I have been to site where they have cleaned the coils, not our people, by the way, where they have cleaned the coils just to leave the dirt underneath the coils to dry up and eventually be pulled back through to the condenser coils. It, it really is something that's not taken very seriously, I'm afraid to say. So um, part of the installation is this new baffle plate. Um, they're, they're made um, and designed by us. They're all painted. Um, they've got pre-drilled holes in. Uh, unlike the existing fan, the, the York fan that we saw, all the electronics are on top of the fan, much easier to work on. I'll talk a little bit about these fans. 
the the the, the fan uh, impeller and motor sit inside this area here, and this is a diffuser. So what it does is it takes um, dynamic pressure and converts it into static pressure, but it also straightens the air, leaving the condenser fan. There you go. Um, which makes it ideal for uh, evaporator fans and for chillers because you're not going to get the recircling. The fans also have a straighted edge, which is to reduce the drag on this back trailing edge. And you can't quite see, but there are winglets on the uh, tips of the blade where the, the fans are at the fastest and it's to reduce the turbulence. There's a small panel installed, which has the a PRD controller in there. And that sends uh, out a 0 to 10 volt signal to the fans. There's a pressure uh, transducer that's installed into each circuit. And that goes into our controller and then tells the fans uh, or is programmed to run the fans at the most uh, appropriate speed. There's a little panel. These are the PID controllers. These are the low pressure screens that are fitted on with pop magnets. If you look in the background of the picture, you'll see there's a bit of building work going on. And um, they reckoned that these screens were absolutely caked within a couple of weeks. Um, and that dirt would have all just gone onto the coils. In terms of, of van comparison, I thought I'd just do a, a quick slide. So that was the initial data, the initial AC fan. And if you make a direct comparison for uh, volume, the power drops from 1.8 to 0.5 kilowatts. Uh, like for like at full speed, we go down to 1.2 kilowatts. But the fans will do 20% more air if required and still consume less power than the original AC fan. And we're at 3.4 meters cubed. We're only using 0.2 of a kilowatt. So this is how the fans operate now, looking at the, the, the graphical uh, interface. So we've now got just about nine bar, and you can see that the fans are being modulated to trying to maintain that new pressure. So, so that's pretty much as stable as the suction pressure, it, now, it, isn't it? It, it? Yes, yeah, it, it's, it, it's very close. Um, so we're looking at about 8.75 bar, so before and after you can see it's much more stable. So the list system lift is reduced from 10.5 bar to 7.25 bar, which is about a 30% difference in performance. So th this lift is, you know, it's very easy to understand. You know, we were up here before or up there you know, and we're down here. There are other benefits as well about operating compressors in more stable conditions because they're not seeing the dramatic changes in pressure but um, maybe we can talk about that another time. The client did appoint some uh, people to do uh, independent m and um, they concluded our calculations were correct. There were no noise issues measured and the client decided not to install the baffling. The return on investment was about 38 months for the project. In conclusion, poor head pressure controls, dirty foul condensers, poor chiller location, and low speed fans can dramatically affect performance and give you the perfect storm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so if you could take this, perhaps take the, oh no, leave the screen share up maybe in case anybody's got any, okay. got any questions about slides. Uh, Daniel, have you picked up any questions in the chat you'd like to relay to Lawrence please um yeah we, we've had some questions about short circuiting um basically one from Nigel Cohen to who's mentioning that the short circuiting usually occurs because because of aesthetics some effort has been made to hide the rooftop plant so how do you overcome this and still retain those aesthetics and I mean, a couple more points below that are, can you install ducts to do this, to pipe the warm air from the condenser fans over the roof line, for instance? Um, and also there's a mention of uh, using water spray bars as evaporative cooling. But 
yeah, what, what do we do about it, given that we want to... Um, it, it is very much um, application specific, um, so it's quite obviously difficult to do. Um, the first question was about rooftop... Um, the aesthetics. Uh, yes. Yeah, but. I mean, it, it, if you can get the right fan and the right controls, you, you should be able to overcome that. If, if um, excuse me, the space around the condenser is infringed, that will have a dramatic effect. But it, it, I'd have to have a look at it to, to give a better comment. And maybe if someone wants to email me some photographs, um, we could we could look at that. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to see and comment without a picture. I think your point was, a couple of points were interesting you made. One was the fact that actually uh, reasonable wind speed across the top might help. And the other one was the fact that the EC fans will, although they can run very slow, will tend to compensate for any short circuit. Yes, by yes. Being yeah. able to uh, overcome it. Um, I had a question, well, uh, Daniel may have some others that have been um, uh, sent in, but I was quite interested to know, in your opinion, what's the balance of savings between the benefit that you get from the cleaning and the benefit that you get from the tighter control? Have you got a feeling for the, the relative benefits of those mm. two measures? No, because we've only ever done cleaning as a um, as a project in its entirety. We haven't done cleaning and then measured it. Um, right. And it, I've seen varying results. So, for example, if a, if a if a chiller is on a step control, it may be that the first pair of fans come on first, and they are not cycled and not rotated, and that part of the condenser will get dirtier quicker. And if you clean those um, cores properly, then you'll start to get an, a, a big improvement because what happens is, is the first part of the condenser gets fouled. The second set of fans come on because pressure has been in, increased. Probably didn't say this in the presentation, but a big advantage about EC fans or, or, or fans with decent fan speed control is for the majority of the year, you won't be running the fans anywhere near full speed. You know, you'll be, be running them under 50% for most of the year. Okay. And, and what that means is, is that the um, velocity of air being pulled onto the coil is very low. Um, and the problem is <clears throat> with um, step control fans is they go on off to full speed. So that velocity of air through the coil is very high. And that's why they tend to get very, very dirty. Okay. So like, a huge, like a huge vacuum cleaner being switched exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, which if you remember when the uh, the we had the problems with the ash cloud, it wasn't really um, uh, the the planes were going to be mechanically failing straight away. It was the massive volume of air that is is going through the jet turbines that would cause the damage. Yeah, because it's 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 such a big volume of air. Yeah, Daniel, any more questions? Yes, there's one about um, compatibility of kit. So if you're installing new fans, how do they work with the existing chiller? unit controllers um do, does the manufacturer have to modify the software at all no we um we put in new controls for the fans the you know we're not affecting the um the, the compressor operation it's just really the fan speed so we put in separate controls in some cases there um there are controllers that we could already use with inside inside the fan that are there but maybe they're not 10 volt signals, but not being used. So um, that's something that we would do. I mean, it, it's a very contentious question because all the chili companies now sell EC fans as standard. Um, most of them will tell you if you ask them, could you retrofit the fans? They will probably try and sell you a new chiller with a service contract. Um, so they're not they're not very uh, forthcoming in. Um, in sort of using this new technology, although we do work with a couple of chiller companies and we are fitting EC fans to their chillers because they can't get um, old AC fans um, uh, available anymore because they, they don't meet the new power uh, energy efficiency requirements for fans. So some of the chiller companies are, are, are being quite helpful and we're getting work from them. 
Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I, at the moment, I'll ask Daniel for one final question because we are somewhat o over time, but it's been very interesting. So I didn't want to... Uh, the adiabatic, to, wasn't it? To, Somebody that's asked. right. Yes. John yeah. Fisk, who I think is on the call, has uh, wrote in advance and asked what energy savings can be achieved through the mesh and water spray systems that can be retrofitted to air cool chillers and dry coolers. Well, um, it's always application specific, but we have fitted adiabatic spray um, or adiabatic mesh um, and EC fans at the same time. Um, the trouble with adiabatic, it's only going to work for a small number of hours per year. So my first point of call would be is how is the chiller operating? What sort of pressure is it operating? How are the fans controlled? And then I would say, then I would say, well, I think actually, if you increase the airflow, you'd make savings all year. Where adiabatic is only going to work when the ambient is above twenty degrees. Yeah, or unless you're in a very arid climate, I, I suppose. Unless you're in a very arid climate. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I think um, what we might do, perhaps, is get you back to talk specifically about that topic at greater length, if you'd be happy to do that. Sure. If, it, some, if there's a if there's sometime a, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, have, we'll have a look at that. Uh, so, Daniel, one last one question from the audience. Um, yes, a quick one. Which is better, speed control on fans or on circulation pumps? Um, <laughs> it, well, you'd have to do an, an, an analysis, wouldn't you? But if you've got water circulating pumps that are 5.5 kilowatts and they're running 24-7, um, and they've got a commission valve that's closed because the flow's too high. It's a no-brainer. It's absolute no-brainer. Um, but if you've got a chiller that's running at a high head pressure with a decent load, and the fans are ten years old, it could, it could be a much bigger energy saving because you're only going to save uh, with a 5.5 kilowatt pump. You're only going to save half of that at the most. So you'll save two two and a half kilowatts an hour where you could be saving 50 kilowatts an hour if you've got decent chiller controls. It is, it is application specific. I'm quite happy if somebody wants to email me or call me to go through a project, um, get some service sheets, and I can give you a, a better, more informed um, advice. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Thanks. Sound like a politician at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Lawrence, thanks ever so much for a really interesting uh, uh, briefing. Uh, I personally found it uh, fascinating and, and very useful, and I'm, sure I'm getting lots of uh, nice feedback from members of the audience oh, as well. Um, now, somebody, at least one person, has asked whether copies of the presentation will be made available. I don't want you to answer that question now, uh, okay. but w one thing for sure is that the recording will be available for anybody that wants to watch it through again and I'll be sending out a link to it um, but you and I can have a chat offline okay. about how much yeah. if anything of the actual presentation proper you'd be happy to share with everybody uh, for now I think I'd like to thank you I'd like to thank uh, Daniel uh, in the background uh, for managing the meeting for me thank all our visitors uh, for turning out uh, today to hear the conversation and keep an eye on the newsletter uh, to hear about uh, when we're be getting together again thanks very much everybody okay. i'm off to i'm off to my next meeting now so thank you very much thank you everyone goodbye bye-bye bye, -bye. Okay. bye.